the process becomes the thing that you can slice and dice and repurpose. It also becomes the strong, one of the strongest things that sets you apart in your brand as a thought leader. You're listening to the Content 10X Podcast, where it's all about content repurposing. I'm Amy Woods, and I'm here to help you maximize your content and find smart ways to get your message in front of more of the right people, whilst also saving time. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Content 10X podcast. I'm your host, Amy Woods, founder of Content 10X, and the Content 10X podcast is here to help you find ways to repurpose and maximize the content that you create. So we want to help you work smarter with your content and with sharing your ideas with the world. Now, this week's episode is a guest interview. I speak with Jason Van Orden, and we speak about how to grow a brand and a business as a thought leader, and the critical role that content plays, and of course, the ways to repurpose content. And Jason shares some great examples of how his clients have really managed to repurpose and maximize their content and their ideas, and have really successful businesses as a result of that. Now, let me introduce Jason. Jason helps authors, academics, and speakers turn their intellectual equity into new streams of scalable income and a business model that amplifies their work. As a consultant, trainer, and strategist, he draws from more than 16 years of experience, including creating multiple successful brands, launching over 60 online courses, teaching more than 10,000 entrepreneurs, earning seven figures in online course sales, and generating 8 million downloads of his podcasts. His mission is to help visionaries with impactful ideas to connect with the people they serve and the problems they can most uniquely solve. Let's get to the interview. Jason, welcome to the show. Yeah. Hi, Amy. It's so great to be here. It's really nice to have you on. So when I was researching for our conversation, I saw that you um, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad when you were in a job and it encouraged you to leave and start a business. And I thought I'd let you know that I, that is the exact same book that I read when I was in a job. <laughs> I was on a holiday in, in um, Naples in Florida for two weeks and I devoured the book from start to finish. And then it completely changed my opinion and, uh, you know, my yeah. view. When I, I, and so I saw that and I thought, wow, <laughs> the same book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's a good one. I think it probably started it off for a lot of people. Yeah, I think it did. What was your position? What what career were you in before you decided to strike out alone? So I spent three years as a software engineer, and I was working for a, a company that made equipment for musicians because I was also a musician. I'd gotten a guitar degree as well, and I thought I'd landed like this dream job. That's like this is great. I get to be an engineer, which is responsible and well-paying and everything, and I get to work in you know with musicians and music gear and stuff. But after it was only like a year and a half or so in that I, I realized it was I was not meant to be employed, and that's probably about when I started reading things like Rich Dad Poor Dad. Um, and that sent me down a path eventually of entrepreneurship. And you've never looked back, I guess. No, no, I've never looked back. <laughs> I figured out I was unemployable and I've, I've stayed that way and just kind of forged my own path along the way. Yeah, I think I consider myself unemployable now as well. It, it sort of strikes fear in me to think of going back to having a boss and, and being in a big sure, yeah. organization. So I shall have to carry on on this journey of, of running my own business, which is fine. I enjoy it. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's it's tough at times, but it, it's never harder or more painful than the thought of going back to somebody else's schedule and goals and you know all the all the things that drove me nuts about corporate culture. Yeah, 100%. I agree. (laughs) Well, I'd really love to speak to you today about what it takes to become known as a thought leader and how to grow a business as a thought leader and really like the role that content plays. And of course, the ways that we can repurpose and maximize the content. So when someone wants to position themselves as a thought leader and develop a business from their ideas and their expertise, I'm guessing it all starts with content, right? Well, I mean, it can, it starts with, like you said, your, your ideas and expertise and your message or your story or the, the thing that matters to you that you want to share. And one of the best ways to do that today, which you know very well, is to 
uh, create and publish content on the internet. I mean, I love the fact that the internet now for a couple of decades or more has allowed people to, to do that, to, to get their ideas in front of an audience that might find what they, what they have to share useful and valuable and then help spread the word for them as well. And so you know, those, those ideas really only have an impact if they're in a form that people can find them. So all the wonderful formats and channels and everything that you help people repurpose into is just an amazing way to establish that thought leadership, authority, and visibility. Yeah, I guess, you know, we are very fortunate that we live in this digital age, aren't we? That's certainly true. <laughs> now, your yeah. website says... What I really help people do is take their beautiful mess of assets and opportunities, mm. tie everything together to create a cohesive business and brand that represents your unique, brilliant values and missions, which is I absolutely love that statement. I love this, what you say about beautiful mess of assets and mm. opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I'm actually, yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. I mean, often people come to work with me uh, I mean, when they want to create new new streams of income from their expertise, but they reach some kind of inflection point. You know, I work with experts and thought leaders, coaches, consultants, speakers, authors who have really put in the time and they're very good at what they what they do. And they're already delivering that value through some format, probably like, again, coaching, consulting, maybe some kind of expert based freelance service or uh, speaking workshops, you know, things like that. Right. But at some point you you can start feeling the, the limitations of how far you've you've come and so when often when somebody comes and starts exploring working with me i've i've discovered it's like well they have all of this stuff to work with and so that beautiful mess of assets and i i call it that because you know just by nature entrepreneurship gets messy we add this we add that we're doing this we're doing that next thing we know we've got all these things and we need a little bit bring a little bit of order to it but you know somebody comes to work with me i'll be looking at what they have and it, you know they might have a great network and obviously their experience they've gotten some results with their and testimonials with their clients they've probably developed some kind of process if they've written a book or if they've been teaching it in a workshop for a while they've got certain connections they might have some uh, association with an organization over here that gives them some credibility so it's all those things that they have that they can leverage that offer them credibility that the the internet and intellectual property that they've pulled together and a, a a good strategic business model is going to leverage those in the the best way in order to help reach and attain those goals that they have the, the those income goals there's goals for for impact and making a difference in their industry and in their world their community uh there's probably some personal goals that they have maybe things bucket list items they'd really like to do in their personal life or their career and so what i see my job as as a strategist for thought leaders is to help them look at all those things it's like okay what's being what are the opportunities that are being overlooked what are the assets that are being under leveraged or how can we connect this thing and that thing and in a more optimized efficient way accelerate your your progress towards those goals that that you have and you know as an entrepreneur we, we all know that it's we get too close right to our own business and so it helps to have somebody who can really help us zoom out and see the bigger picture again and and the things that that we might be overlooking in our day-to-day -day of just trying to keep the business the business going and so that's something that I just absolutely love doing because i get very excited about people's ideas and i get very excited and I, when i start seeing the possibilities of what we could do with everything that they have have. And so then we work together to come up with a plan and to, again, increase their impact, their, their uh, reach, their opportunities, their credibility, all those things. And how do you understand what is the right approach for certain people? Are there certain like sort of different flags that say to you, okay, this is going to be the right approach for this person based on, you know, their mess of assets, their, yeah. their opportunities is, is this type versus this type of this. How do you just Start, I guess, going down the right angle for different people. Yeah, I, I love this question as well, because, you know, often people will come with a very specific idea of, hey, Jason, I want you to help me launch this online course, or I'd love you to help me optimize my messaging to see if I can get it working better to sell this or that. But once we start, again, zooming out to look at everything, there, there usually is some work to make sure that we do move forward in a way that's going to be well aligned with who they are, who they serve, and what it is that they want to achieve. So to specifically answer your question, uh, first of all, there, there's often some work that we do zooming all the way out into like the big vision. And I say, what are some of those big dominoes I call them? I get that from the, the book, The One Thing, where he talks about little domino can knock down another one a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. And then by about 30 dominoes, you've got one that's the size of an empire state building that you're knocking over, right? So what are some 
of those big vision items. Uh, like for me, I'd love to uh, have an adjunct professor kind of position at some point. That's just something I would love to do, go back to university and teach there in some capacity, or maybe it's to you know, write that book or have a TEDx talk or to collaborate with a specific person. So what are those things so we can make sure we're heading uh, in the direction of those with even the, the near-term goals that we're working on? And then the next thing that I look at is we look at their business and think, okay, well, I call it growth levers. In the end, there's only three ways to grow your business. It's either you put more leads in to the system. So you attract more of your ideal people you want to work with. You either convert more of those people into customers through your customer journey, your content, your sales process, your marketing, or you increase the value that you know, what we call the lifetime value that you deliver to every person that you work with and then that they pay you for as well. So more leads convert more into customers or increase the amount of money and value that is being exchanged per customer. And so in each business at any given time, at least smaller businesses like uh, like I, I work with, you know, this is different if there's big departments in a corporation where every department's working on a different part of the business, marketing, sales, uh, HR, you know, but in a business uh, like the ones I work with, where there might be a few team members or whatever, there's usually one of those levers that's going to give the biggest results at any given time. So we do a bit of analysis and go, okay, well, what you really need to focus on right now is the conversion piece. So let's come up with strategies that are going to do that. So we've looked at vision, we've looked at uh, growth levers. And then the next, last thing I do is kind of a good old um, people might have heard of this in business, we have what's called a SWOT analysis. So there's a form of a SWOT analysis because we look at their strengths, look at their weaknesses, what might be lacking. We look at opportunities and we look at threats. You know, what are things that might have shifted or what could shift in the marketplace or that could, you know, is there a cash flow crunch threatening them? Is there, did they just lose a big client and that's a threat? So with that, uh, SWOT analysis and, and and looking at the resources, like do they have a lot of time and not so much money, or do they have a lot of money and a lot of connections but not so much time? And with so basically with these criteria, I'm kind of creating a, a sort of Venn diagram and the cross section of all of these criteria: their vision, the growth levers, the SWOT analysis, their resources, and in the end, just a little bit of also who they are, what they prefer, what their strengths and interests are. You know, if we're coming up with a content creation strategy. You know, you might as well go with the formats and the channels that are going to be feel good to you. So you'll be consistent at it. Right. So it's aligning with all of those things so that you're maximizing, again, your own resources and also your own energy and fulfillment and what you're getting out of the, the, the process and the journey itself as well. So that's kind of a high level what the strategic analysis looks like. And then we start breaking it down to like, OK, yeah. well, if we need more conversions, here are some things we could do. Here's some 10 different things. Okay, maybe we'll focus on these two because that looks like it has the most promise or whatever the case may be. And then we break it down into an actual plan and metrics and you know, how do you stay on track and, and those kinds of things. But that's that's the process that I go through in working with the client. And do you find that quite often like clients come to you and they've been maybe creating lots and lots of content? So they're sitting on sort of, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of blog posts or they're kind of halfway through that book and 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 they're spinning wheels like they're like a hamster just creating lots of content. And they're asking you, how can I turn this into something that I can monetize or um, position myself differently but is it does you often see that people are just stuck in like constant creation mode without kind of taking that step back yeah and it's it, there sometimes there is that strategic layer that's missing and again just because you're yeah. too close to us so they're creating regularly this amazing content that's part of that beautiful mess of assets what i call you know that uh the intellectual property and the um intellectual equity is actually what i what i refer to it as and so um there are a couple different cases. One is the case where they they know that they want to create a new income stream. And this this often happens, you know, a coach or consultant's working one-on-one -on -one with people, but now they've maxed out on how much time of their time they can sell. So they're like, I need something that's more scalable, a group program, a digital course, or something like that. Or they've been teaching offline uh, or well, in real the real world, as we say, the um, workshops and speaking. And they're like, well, I need to cut down on my travel. So I'm looking for ways to re-leverage this. So that's the one category. So they've got this uh, content that they've been delivering through other formats and now they want to shift it in some way to change how their their uh, their their makeup of their income streams now then the other one is where they're they can just sense yeah i'm doing all this stuff and i, I don't feel like i'm getting as many results out of it as i should 
Um, or, you know, they're saying, hey, I, I, I'm just working so much, but I, okay, you say I need to say we've gone the growth lever of generate more leads, right? And so they're, they're thinking about, okay, great. So you're saying I need to generate more leads, but I'm already so busy with all this other stuff. How am I supposed to? And often what hasn't occurred to them is there's a way to uh, what I call stack the ROI. And I can go into that a little bit more. It's actually a pretty key concept of, of the strategy work and that where in that whole Venn diagram of here are the different things you could be doing to move forward towards your big vision and, and grow your business. You know, here are the two or three that uh, that are going to move forward four or five things all at the same time. And let me give you an example. Um, for instance, so um, for instance, I, um, you know, if, I, I think we've probably talked about this maybe when we've had a chat, uh, a podcast or a lot, like a podcast is a great thing you can stack the ROI with. If I have a goal um, to generate more leads, well, certainly a podcast can can help with that. A podcast is also just a great way for me to kind of work out my my own intellectual property. It's a great networking tool. So if I have um, <clears throat> goals I'm working towards to to meet certain people in the marketplace, or say that that adjunct professor thing, right? Maybe I'm, there's certain people I want to try to meet because that might connect me into some universities. I can invite them to be on my podcast. So now it's a networking thing as well. So I try to find those opportunities for myself and for people where. By focusing on one thing, it's actually moving four or five things forward at uh, at the same time. And, and content is, is one of those things that um, can stack the ROI. You, you can be writing blog posts regularly, and eventually that starts becoming pieces of your book. You're testing out you know, a piece of your book, but you're doing content marketing and building uh, up anticipation that whole time as well, right? Or mm -hmm. uh, you know, your podcast could be the the same as well so those are the opportunities i'm looking for uh, in fact i'll go ahead and give an example i've got one client who has been writing a book and every chapter is on a different theme and so she's in the art space and this is a book that's meant for performers uh, choreographers dancers uh, you know anybody who'd be on stage directors that kind of uh, you know, performance art and it helps them look at their art in a different way so they can kind of shake up their own process or find that kind of a new way forward. Kind of like we're talking about strategy and business, right? And so she started taking each of these chapters. And at one point she wanted to start a community, a membership site and community for choreographers and dancers and performers because she saw this, this need, particularly as the pandemic was coming into like, okay, artists are having a harder time, like connecting and staying creative and things like that. Well, she was able to take each chapter of that book, which was still wasn't released and she's still finishing it up, but she turned each of those chapters into a theme for a month. And so one of the things they would get was this essay, which would kind of help them think about a, a thing in a new way. So like one of them was about time, right? And time when you're performing, you know, you can elongate time, you can have very quick, you know, so it's like, it's like this concept of time and getting to think about time and their art differently. And at the end, there's some different uh, th activities or things they can think about to try to shake up their process. Well, she can take that and make a whole month theme out of that, right? She can have a live uh, call where there's a discussion about it. She can put out a, here's a suggested project that you can work on to try to apply this stuff in a new way, then bring it back here and we'll do feedback on it. And so she was repurposing her book for her membership site. She also sells packets of those essays separately. She sells them to university professors. Sometimes they're looking for new material, right? To be able to buy, um, or to, to, to integrate into their curriculum if they want some, some new ideas to put into there as well. So there's all these different ways that she's using that intellectual property. Uh, she also uses it in her marketing too. She sometimes uses bits and pieces of that for her newsletter. And then there was one launch that we did for her where we wrote this other series of, of five essays and she realized, wow, these would be great in the book. So these launch emails, which again, you think of this like very promo-y thing, but they're, they're also very value packed. So we just took the value piece, uh, she fleshed that out a bit and that became a new chapter for her book. So it was like her income streams and her book and her content marketing were all stacking the ROI around this, you know, this, this book that she was, that she was writing. And so that's an example of like ways that I try to find for my clients to, to stack the ROI in that way. Hey, just a little break from this podcast episode to ask you a question. Would you like one single place that you can go to that provides you with everything you need to be able to implement the best practices in content repurposing for your video content, your podcast episodes, and your social media content today? To help you get more value from the content that you create, get more time back, and help you reach more people than you ever thought possible. 
If so, then you are going to love the Content 10X Toolkit. The toolkit is full of video tutorials, templates, checklists, swipe files, step-by-step -step guides, and more that shows you how to repurpose your content in the best ways possible today. No more Googling, no more figuring it out yourself. We provide you with everything that you need to become a content repurposing pro. If this sounds like something that would interest you, then go check out the Content 10X Toolkit at content10x.com forward slash toolkit. Okay, I'm back to this week's episode. It's very much a mindset, isn't it, in terms of being able to see the the value and the opportunity in your content or in, you know in your intellectual property and you know quite often when people uh, sometimes I'll speak to people who are looking to do something different with the content and they might say that they're looking to launch a podcast but they don't really know what they would speak about mm -hmm. and they have a book or they've got hundreds of, yeah. of articles and it's like well you, you know you could speak about each individual article but just put it into your own words add an extra story you know like embellish certain points and you know but not really always seeing those opportunities of what yeah. you're actually sitting on and what you actually have and, and thinking that you have to start from scratch which you don't do you have any examples of where somebody so this was this was awesome because she she had a book and then she saw the opportunity to kind of break down the book and get more content from that. What about the other way where because I saw you work with quite a lot of authors. So have people come to you wanting to become an author and publish that book and you've guided them through what they already have that already exists that can become a book? You know, yeah, like you said, I work with lots of authors and and yeah. there are times where it's like, hey, I've got this book and this has been plenty of times where I've got this book, I'd like to make it, you know, into a course version or I'm writing this book, I'd like to make a course. Now, I also see the flip of that too, where somebody wants to write a book and one of the things that I'll encourage them to do, you know, in thought leadership books, obviously these are often nonfiction books and we're sharing some big idea or process for a specific audience, right? And sometimes we're, so it's 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 important to to refine that audience because you might be going from hey I've been doing this kind of stuff one on one in a very bespoke nuanced way and now I got to write a book that can be for a broader audience, and so I'll encourage them to run like a pilot live group program or something like that where it's like okay the course is actually going to set them up for the book because then they've got this 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 real world laboratory, if you will, of people that they're working with to kind of refine the process. And they might be drawing from stuff that they've already done with clients before. But now when you've got a group of say 10, 15, 20 people in a program that you're guiding through this, suddenly you start getting questions maybe you hadn't got before. So you're like, okay, great. Now I can see I might need to refine this, or I might need to create a little framework over here, or I need a better example there. And so uh, I mean, I'm sure, in fact, maybe I should do this. I, I could go back to um, you know, my group program that I run for six months and I could easily turn those, in fact, I think I probably will do this, turn that into a, um, you know, a book about thought leadership business models and how to take that beautiful mess of assets and create a business model that supports the goals and aspirations that, that you, um, that you have. So that's, that's also something that I've, uh, encouraged clients to do as well is, is to just go and run a program. And then, you know, maybe that group program is just something they run as a one-time pilot or maybe they run it a couple of times, but you know, it, it might become an ongoing then stream of income. Maybe it's just for that period of time while they're working out the book. And then they put that stuff into a digital course as well at some point. But uh, yeah, the, the, you can go book to course, but you can also have co course to, to book at the same time as well. Yeah, I love that. I love what you say about it. It's, it's all just stacking the ROI, isn't it? And the, I guess the stack might go up and down a little bit as things come in and things come out, but I, I love that concept. <laughs> so for yourself personally, I know that you have been podcasting as we chatted before I hit record. Was it 2004? Did you say that you started? Um... 2005, yeah. So podcasting kind of first blipped at the end of 2004 and then it showed up on my radar at the beginning of 2005 and mid 2005, I started my first podcast. And how, how has that through your career and your coaching business, how has the podcast been able to help you get your ideas out there? And I guess, as you said, um, develop and grow relationships as well through the podcasting. Yeah. So with, uh, like with my podcast right now, so, so okay, first of all, I'll say this. So the first podcast, one of the first podcasts I started became my, my first business, which was, was quite successful. And it, it, it unexpectedly became very popular. Now it was good timing too. We were in the right 
we started the first podcast by internet business. So it really took off, grew a list and then became a business. Now today that's changed a little bit. I've started a new podcast in the last couple of years. It doesn't have the same listenership as that last one. Like that last one would get up to like 30,000 people listening. It's a fraction of that, that I have now. Right. But it's still worth it for me to do my podcast. Of course, I have aspirations to grow it. It may never become as big as my old show and that's, that's okay. But I know where my podcast sits in my, my business model. And so, for instance, I know that for me, when I'm talking about my ideas, either in an interview like this or recording my podcast, that's where I can really come up with and refine my ideas in a way that maybe I don't when I'm writing. And that's just a preference, a strength, a, the, the way that it works well for me. So it's, it's a great kind of top of the pyramid or funnel, however you want to look at it, of, of just kind of driving all of my content. A lot of my ideas start there. So that's one purpose that it serves for me, right? Um, another purpose, I also know that for me, I think a podcast shines actually for anyone really well um, in a customer journey. In a customer journey, you've got gain attention at the beginning, then you've got earn trust in the middle, and you've got you got to inspire them to action or get them, you know, call to action to buy in the third piece there. And podcasts really shine in the middle, gain people's trust. So I'm always talking about or trying to demonstrate my ideas and expertise in a way on my podcast such that I might be attracting people through other channels, but then through my newsletter and whatever and social media, if I can get them to listen to certain episodes of my podcast, that that's going to kind of tee up my ideal clients and customers then to want to work with me one-on-one -on -one or sign up for one of my group programs. So that's another thing that it fulfills is it's a piece of my customer journey and, and conversion part of things as well. But then, yeah, I also, as I meet new people at, uh, I, I hold networking events and I put to, I organize a uh, little mastermind sometimes. And, you know, I'm just always meeting new people. And when I meet somebody I'm really fascinated to know more about, and I know my audience might be interested. Well, it's a great way to solidify that relationship and add value to invite them to come on my show. So it's fulfilling that thing for me as well. Plus I'm often um, repurposing little bits and pieces from my course into that as well, which, which is part of the um, conversion thing, but it's also, um, you know, giving people those, those lead magnets and little tastes of, you know, to pull them onto my list. So it does do a bit of, of list building. So you can see all these different things that that podcast plays a role for. And I do want to write, it's been a while since I've written a book. I do want to write another book. And so I'm always thinking about with the podcast as kind of, again, going back to my first point as a place that I'm, I'm playing with and generating some of those ideas that'll eventually go into the book and trying to discover which ones land and, and should definitely be in the book and maybe which ones aren't as, uh, as interesting to the audience. Mm. Yeah. That's what I did with my, when I did my book, I think I was maybe sitting on about a year and a half's worth of content and I planned out the, the book and the, the, uh, the chapters and what I wanted to cover. Then I looked to see where have I already created content on some of these ideas and some of these chapters so that I could go in like repurpose, but take it and then, then add more to it, but not start from a blank canvas on those topics. And then it was great because it highlighted to me the other things that I wanted in my book that I hadn't ever actually created a blog post about or a podcast about before. So I was able to create that content. So do the speaking, get all my thoughts out there, do that podcast episode, get the blog post, and then, you know, take that as the starting point of content for the book. So it was a, it was a nice way to fill some gaps and get my ideas out in the way that I like speaking. And then, you know, it all kind of came together as, as being more than just writing a book, but it also was podcast episodes and blog posts and social content and things like that. So right. it's like stuck in the content, content ROI, I guess. Right. <laughs> yeah. If you were to start today with video being, you know, very much powerful medium and a lot more prevalent now than back in 2005, would you still go podcast or do you think you would have thought, Hmm, I think I need to start video content. Yeah. So in terms of Okay, there's always the ideal and then there's what's just going to work best and and certainly there are a lot of compelling stuff about video and I think video is a good an important part of the mix whether that's you know live story you know like stories on Instagram and now LinkedIn has them too or whether that's uh, broadcasting live or whether that's you know just uploaded native videos that you're putting into a, a social media or a YouTube channel right all these different ways and um you know for 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 me I've just I know that 
again, the podcast is a great way for me to first get the, the content out there and put together. And so, uh, and now I don't always do a good job as this as, as I should, but what, so my goal is then to at times take pieces of that content and turn it into something that can be used as, um, as video content and just make that a part of my content workflow. Now that said, I make video content all the time for my courses as well. So I have thought at times about, you know, and you know, you, you know, this can get complex with all the repurposing and it's just about adding more delegation to people and systems and automations, right? So this is also on my radar to do as well, where I can take pieces of my course content and start putting that out um, through through channels online um, as well. So, you know, for, for some people, it might make the most sense. I mean, a lot of people say, hey, video is like the, the primo way to start because you can extract the audio and you can do it and chop it up. And, and that's true in a lot of ways, but this just kind of goes back to that Venn diagram I was alluding to. Like, I think it's important to consider like, what do you enjoy? What are your strengths? What are you going to be consistent as? Where are you going to shine best? And if I can show up more easily and, and regularly doing podcast content and then figure out how to make it into video because that just works for me, then that's what I, I um, focus on. Um, I do enjoy dabbling in video and I've bought fancy tools to do the video, but it's also just more logistics. It's more complex. You know, you got to comb your hair. You got to have the, a good microphone like with audio, but you also might have to think about what shirt am I wearing, right? And what, what's the lighting like? And, and we just naturally, and here's another thing. It's like, I've gotten to the point with having podcasts now for 16 years, where audio, you know, can just come out and there's very little editing for me to do, whereas video, I'm just going to be more prone to like, there needs to be edits for somebody to make. So these are just all things that I'm considering in terms of the cost versus what I'm trying to do and what just feels feels best to me. Um, but video is important as a part of the content mix. So that's that's for sure. Yeah, I think you're completely right. I saw a tweet the other day. Somebody said, it's two tweets, actually. One tweet, somebody said, if you aren't, if you have a podcast and you aren't recording yourself on camera too, so you are not recording the video, you know, you're, you're mad, you know, you're, you're crazy, you know, you're missing the trick and things like that. And I thought, well, I don't actually agree with that. This, they, they are two still two separate mediums. And whilst we do often repurpose some videos to a podcast and work with loads of clients that do that. It's not, it's not for everyone. It's not the same. And it's not right. as easy as just flicking the camera on. Like you said, you're going to be thinking about the background. You're going to be thinking about your appearance. You're going to be, I would expect presenting it in a slightly different way when considering a visual aspect as well as audio aspect. So, you know, kind of flipping sort of, if you're doing a podcast and you don't record the video to you crazy, it's like, mm, not too sure right. on that. And there was another one where somebody said, um, it was the same, I suppose. Somebody said, isn't, isn't a podcast just audio from video? Like that is the definition of a podcast. Not, that's not quite the definition. Not it's quite, not always. No. no, exactly. So I completely agree with you. Um, so one one final question. Um, for anybody who is really trying to take the first steps towards developing a business based on on their thought leadership and they are being held back, what would you say is the kind of biggest, I guess mindset shift that often you see people make in order to just start taking just the first strides forward and breaking through barriers that they potentially see towards them being able to do to do just that so here's what i would share which is a bit of a, a mindset shift uh we talked about how the internet has really changed the game in terms of how we acquire information and get guidance and community and all those kinds of things right you go back 20 30 plus years and it's all going to be big media and big organizations and government and that's where we would get this stuff so anybody becoming a thought leader was not an easy like you had to write a book you had to be on the news you had to and that's not the case anymore so what i refer to it as like like you know, so Spotify, with Spotify, I can find any kind of music that I want to listen to. So if I want to listen to jazz klezmer music, which some people might be, I don't even know what it is. And I don't listen to jazz klezmer, but it's just a good example of something very specific, right? And it does exist. If you were to search that in Spotify, you're going to find the playlist, you're going to find the groups, you're going to find that specific thing, right? And so we live in a day and age that just like us as consumers of music, where we're, we're used to be able to find that specific music, it's the same thing with, again, information and guidance and help. And, and so, you know, whether we're looking for a coach or a course or belonging or whatever the case may be, 
there are people out there that you are just the right Spotify channel or artist or, or genre for them, right? Because of your background, who you are, your strengths, your perspective on things, uh, and that they're going to resonate with you. I, I talk about in, in your brand and your content, you need to have relevance and resonance. Relevance is, okay, you're speaking to a top of mind, pain, problem, challenge, goal that they want to achieve and, and that they're actively looking so that when they see you talking about, they're like, oh, th th you're going to get a few seconds of my attention because it's kind of broken through the spam filter in my brain. Resonance is going to keep them there when they're like, I, I, you, I like your vibe. You know, you, you've got your values are like mine or you're serving a very, a very specific population that I consider myself a part of or whatever the case may be. So, you know, just because somebody's relevant doesn't mean that they're going to be resonant to everybody. And there are all you need is a fraction of what 8 billion or however many people there are in the world in order to have a successful business. So that's the mindset shift is to discover, like, what is your Spotify playlist channel genre? And you define that by knowing, well, here's who I serve best. Here's how I serve them best. Here are the outcomes that they want that I know I can give them. And then here's the last key piece is knowing your signature process for achieving those things. And they may be similar or incorporate other ideas that other people in your field also apply in getting those results for people. But still, you have your approach, your way of answering questions, your processes, your framework, your whatever the, the case may be. And actually, if you get that nailed down, here is my signature process to help this specific audience to get that specific outcome. It's really the process that you're repurposing. It's not the content itself, right? The reason you go book to course or course to book is you're developing a process by teaching the course that then a high level overview of that process becomes a book or vice versa. You write the book, which forces you to figure out your process. And now it may be every chapter or every piece of that becomes a module or something within the course or you're invited to take do a keynote well you zoom into one piece of your signature process you pull that out you know and now it's your your keynote or you need maybe a lower end uh, or just a lower price course for your acquiring new customers to dip their toe into working with you so you take your process and maybe the first two pieces of that process are now a standalone digital course that people can buy to get a taste of what it's like to uh, to work with you. So the process becomes the thing that you can slice and dice and repurpose. It also becomes the strong one of the strongest things that sets you apart in your brand as a thought leader. So the answer to your question is owning the fact that you've got that process, you've got that Spotify channel to occupy, you've got that set of people waiting to get that from you. And then everything we're talking about here is just finding the right formats and channels that fit you and your goals and those people the best for communicating that process, that message to those people in order to get them those outcomes that they're looking for. Yeah, absolutely love that answer. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> you have to find your secret sauce, I guess, don't you? And and uh, be able to communicate. Now that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Jason. Really, really great conversation. Loved it. Um, I know everyone's going to get so much value. So I'll say thank you on behalf of all the listeners as well. <laughs> um, pleasure, so yeah. where where would you like uh, to be to people to go if they want to just connect with you, find out more about what you do? Yeah, so my site's a good place to go, jasonvanorden.com. I'd encourage people to check out my podcast. It's called Impact. Yeah. And it's all about the business of thought leadership. So you can click the podcast. Uh, thing in the navigation on my website. And of course, I've got a newsletter as well. If you sign up for my newsletter, you get a couple of my best frameworks for starting to figure out that that you, what, what is most unique about your message and about what you're sharing with the world. So you can start putting together that really uh, uniquely communicated process that's going to set you apart in the world. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I'll add the link in the show notes to your website and to your newsletter and to your website and everything. So um, thank you. Um, yeah, it's been a great conversation. So thanks, Jason. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You too, Amy. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that discussion and thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoy the Content 10X podcast, then why not hit that subscribe button on your podcast listening app of choice so that you can get updated when new episodes are released. And I'd really, really appreciate it if you could leave a review as well. That really makes a difference for the podcast. Also, please do get a copy of my book, Content 10X, more content, less time, maximum results. It is the ultimate 
ultimate guide to repurposing every type of content. And it's available on Amazon, in Kindle and paperback, and also in audiobook as well. And you can head to content10x.com forward slash book to find all the other places that you can get a copy of my book. And if you would like us to do your content repurposing for you, then we offer a fully end-to-end done-for-you content repurposing service. This is for podcasters and video content creators. We have our podcast 10x, video 10x, and also our specific LinkedIn 10x service, helping you to become the leading authority in your industry on LinkedIn. You can find out so much more about our services on our website. And also, please do give me a follow on the social media platforms. I share lots and lots of tips and advice on social media about content repurposing. I'm at Content 10X on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And if you try content10x.com forward slash LinkedIn, you'll find my LinkedIn profile over there as well. All that's left to say is thank you so much for listening to this week's episode and I'll catch you in the next one.